Hi, my name is Bill Konigsberg and I'm an author. Uh, and I am here today to present to you a virtual class. And this class is called Writing the Hard Scenes. And what I'm talking about there is the scenes that let's say are from your life, things that have happened in your life that you might wanna use and maybe you wanna change into fiction. Or maybe you just wanna write them because it's helpful to write some things that have happened in your life. I'll talk a little more about that in a moment. But right now, what I'm gonna just do is tell you a little bit about me. Uh, you see my weird little head here on the screen and it's blocking only one book, so that's good. Um, I'm the author of six young adult novels. I've been writing young adult novels for about 13 years now. And my first one was Out of the Pocket. And uh, that was about a gay football player who is outed against his will uh, and becomes a national mm -hmm. story. The second one was the one at the bottom called Openly Straight. And Openly Straight is uh, about a boy who goes across the country to an all boys boarding school to recreate himself without the label gay. He's openly gay at home and he's tired of being thought of as the gay kid. Uh, my I'm going to go out of order because the fourth book, not the third, is the sequel to Openly Straight, and it's the one that's called Honestly Ben. And it's uh, from the point of view of a boy who considers himself straight, uh, but falls in love with a gay boy. Uh, then the third book was The Porcupine of Truth, which is sort of hard to explain, but basically it's a, it's a road trip novel where a boy uh, from New York City goes out to Billings, Montana for the summer to visit his father and winds up going on a wild road trip with a new friend uh, to solve a family mystery that's about 30 years old. Uh, and then the final two, The Music of What Happens, uh, is about two boys who fall in love while working on a food truck one summer. And The Bridge, which is a very different book for me, it's about uh, a boy and a girl who meet on top of the George Washington Bridge in New York City. Uh, they're both suicidal and they're both there to jump. And it's about all the possibilities of the things that could happen based on the choices that they make there. So those are my books in case you are wondering who I am. And what we're gonna talk about today, as I said, sort of writing the hard stories or the hard scenes. Uh, I'm talking today about how we can use our own lives to create fiction from truth. Uh, and really I'm focusing on those difficult moments in our lives. Now my head is on a foot right now, so I'm gonna go like this and you can see uh, just different ideas of things that could be a difficult moment. Cause what does that mean? Uh, a, a difficult moment could be anything from, you know, you missed the bus and you had a hard day at school uh, or you lost the game for your team in soccer uh, to your parents getting divorced when you were younger. I mean, it could be anything. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to start by reading three different scenes. The first one is going to be true, a true scene that I wrote based on something that happened in my life, and then two fictionalized versions that I put into two of my books, The Porcupine of Truth and then The Bridge. And after we do that, uh, it's going to be at your chance to do some writing. So... Uh, we will uh, do three different exercises and we'll talk about those after we uh, hear these examples. So I want you to take a chance just to listen now. I'm not gonna put up the, uh, the words on the screen. So you're just gonna have to listen to the scenes. And uh, let's see if I can find the first one. This first one is just something I wrote one time because I wanted to write about something that happened to me when I was younger. And what happened to me when I was younger in this case is that my parents divorced when I was about four years old. And so I'm just, I wrote this as an essay or a piece of an essay to remember it. And it goes like this. My father lifts me high into the air until my head is just inches from the, the kitchen ceiling. He spins in frantic circles, tears streaming down his cheeks. I'm ecstatic and scared for my life as much as a four-year-old boy can feel both of those things at the same time. There is no air, no way to breathe here in this memory. In this moment of ecstasy and profound sorrow, 
I go back there to relive the experience and try to breathe, but find myself suffocating, heavy blankets of breathless panic pushing down on my chest. I had been sitting in, the play, in my playpen in the living room, bells and whistles, bright colors spinning above me. It took little to captivate my attention. My mother sat at her desk nearby and you tended to her studies. It was 1975, the height of the women's lib movement, and my mother had responded to my father's wish that she not work while my sister and I were young by throwing him out and going on with her plan to go to school. She was studying to be a psychologist. As I remember it, even before the doorbell sounded that morning, the tension in the air was somehow palpable, as if charged with the, enemy, uh, the energy of what was about to occur. The bell rang, and my mother tentatively crossed the room and went to the front door. I heard familiar but muffled tones. It was the sound of an argument between familiar voices. I can't say for sure what my father and my mother argued about or what they said. For some reason, I believe my father called my mother a nightmare. For some reason, I believe my mother told my father he was worthless. To a four-year-old child alone, oh, sorry, I told my father he was worthless, but I do remember the explosion. To a four-year-old child alone in a room, the sound of a door being kicked in sounds like an explosion, just the same as the fireworks had sounded weeks earlier on the night of July 4th, when my mother had to comfort me because the world kept exploding in my ears. The next thing I heard were, were the rushing hooves of my dad charging through the house, looking for me. The next thing I saw was a man who had become a maniac charging at me, like the time I had broken an antique bowl in the living room and he had charged at me with fists. My father found me in my playpen in the living room and lifted me high in the air until I was soaring inches from the ceiling. He made me high. My father spun me around in the air, repeating the words, my son, my son, as if it was some sort of incantation that would set the world right again. The world seemed to cease around us. It was just him and me, and we locked eyes as I spun around him, above him. A thrilling shiver ran through my chest. He spun me for what seemed like hours, a rhythmic pulsing dance through the air, his, fair, his face shining below me, his eyes peering not into me, but right through me. The police arrived within 15 minutes and they restrained my father and took him away in handcuffs. The house was quiet again, but my brain, it would never be perfectly quiet again. So that's a real personal scene that I wrote there. And you know, I think all of us have some stories in our lives that were hard times. And that's an example of one from me. But as I said, it doesn't have to be that your parents divorced. It could be anything from missing the bus to a grandparent passing away. Uh, we all have difficult moments of, ad of adversity. So that is a moment that happened in my life. And uh, you might have noticed when I read it that I was trying to create a scene so that you could feel it so that instead of just telling you what happened by saying things like I was scared, I was trying to show you what that scary feeling was like for a little boy. Uh, maybe you felt it while you were reading, while you were hearing it, maybe not. Um, so I want to take it from there and I want to take a chance to read two shorter scenes uh, from two different books that I have written. And pay attention because these are going to be a little bit like your uh, assignments that I'm going to give you. Uh, these are beginning assignments, and this is from somebody who's been writing for a while. But uh, take a notice of, about this. Um, in The Porcupine of Truth, uh, I, I write about a character <clears throat> named Carson Smith, whose father also left him when he was a young boy. But he's a different character and the situation was different because it's fiction. And the great, great thing about fiction is that we can write anything we want and it can include parts of the truth from our own lives and parts of made up stuff. Uh, and that's really why I love fiction because sometimes fiction 
can tell truth better than reality. So listen to this scene about what happened to Carson uh, when he was younger. It's early that last morning and I'm sitting on the stoop outside the front door in my yellow pajamas. Mom is cradling a green duffel bag to her torso. Icy tears stream down her face like rain on a windshield, except there are no wipers to sweep them away. Mom is melting and moms are not supposed to melt. Dad is, I don't know where, but he's wearing Bermuda shorts. I know something ir irreversibly terrible is happening. The earth is shifting below my feet and there's a rumbling earthquake, earthquake like when the subway comes into the 79th street station, shaking the entire platform. It rattles my entire body, rearranging my insides, changing my chemistry. But that part of the memory can't belong in Billings at all because I'd never been on a subway then. So that means I'm not, that means it's not quite true. I am holding a red dye. Not sure why I'm, why I'm holding it or where it came from, but I remember the feeling of its dull corners pressing against my tiny fingers. I remember thinking that if I hold on to the die a little bit longer, a bit harder, an all loving God will make this earthquake stop, will stop the flood of icy eye water that is turning my powerful mom into a puddle. God, like the one grandma Phyllis believes in, the one she says prayers to. Dad walks out in his red Bermuda shorts, no shirt, smoking a cigarette. It's like watching a movie now because I am not there. Mom and dad on a screen, yelling at each other, way too loud for how close they are standing. Mom with tears streaming down, turning my stomach inside out. I remember watching and thinking, no, let's stop. Like I'm asking God, like I'm asking my parents. I don't know if I say this or I think this. I have no idea. And the answer to my words or prayers is that my mom grabs my left arm and pulls. Her hand wets my arm and makes it feel slippery. She says, come on, honey. And I am dragged away. I scream. I scream to my dad. I scream to the universe. Stop this from happening. The world is ending. The world is ending. Stop this. I drop the die. I never get to see how it lands if it stays on the stoop or falls to the ground and no one stops the world from ending. So you've now heard two scenes and I wonder what you're thinking because you know in the scene that I read that was true that my parents divorced when I was very little but now you've heard a different version of it. And did you notice some things about that as I was reading? Uh, there were some things that I was putting into that scene, uh, and it, it might have been confusing to you or, or curious to you about why. Do you remember there was a red die, like, like dice? Um, I guess my question is, why do you think I might have put that in there? Also, the thing about the rattling of the subway, rattling his insides, why do you think I put that in there? Those are some good questions that maybe you can talk about as a class uh, if you want to but there's a reason for everything. And I'm not gonna tell you what I think my reason is because sometimes it doesn't really matter what the author thinks the reason is, it matters what you think. So anyway, one last scene I'm gonna read before we do some exercises. Uh, this scene is from my most recent book, which is called The Bridge. And surprise of surprises, it again involves a parent leaving, but this one's a little bit different. Uh, it's also in third person, so you'll notice instead of me writing it as I, it's he. In this case, he is a boy named Aaron Boroff, who is 17 years old, uh, and he's uh, thinking back to what happened when, on a night when he was much younger, when he was eight. He was sitting on the floor doing a puzzle. What eight-year-old does puzzles alone on their floor? Ones like Aaron. His mother came in. She was wearing skinny jeans. They were fundamentally not mommy-ish. He knew that even then. He saw it and it registered, but he didn't know why or how it mattered, but it did. 
She sat down on the floor, also on mommyish behavior. Her flowing blonde hair was so, so pretty. She looked like a movie star almost. So I'm moving to Boston, she said, as if she were saying, I'm going to the store. Aaron nodded. He knew better than to ask why. There were questions you didn't want the answer to. Instead, he just said, oh. She said, you'll come to visit, like all the time, probably in the summer, maybe half the summer, at least a month, probably. I don't know. We'll see. OK, he said. Sometimes you change things up. Something's got to give. When you're older, you'll understand. And Aaron nodded and nodded. And she told him he was such a good kid. And he knew that he was. But he wondered, would he one day understand? Because he fundamentally didn't. But he knew better than to ask. Nine years later, he doesn't really understand. Or he does kind of. There are levels of shininess in the world. There's glitter, like the kind that shocks your eyes when you glance at it, and it's like looking into a million pieces of sun glimmering. There's the shininess of a chocolate cake in a patisserie window, the chocolate frosting seemingly lacquered on, and you think it's almost too shiny to eat, but boy, would you like to. There's normal shiny, like people in Central Park, and depending on the angle of the sun, there might be a glint off a forehead, or there might not be. There might be a shade and shadow showing their fundamental unworthiness. And then there's dull. The things, the people upon whom the sun never shines. The invisible, really. His mom loves shiny things. The world does. He is invisible. He will become shiny if it kills him. So that was a very different scene there. And uh, you might have noticed there were some more things going on there that were fictional, uh, that were about Aaron, because Aaron as a character is different than um, me, uh, than Carson from The Porcupine of Truth. And so I was, fixing, I was putting in some things that are important to me. Uh, the fact that my parents divorced when I was younger, I write about a lot, as you see, but I changed it up uh, in some important ways. Um, did you notice at the end uh, that he was talking about shininess a lot? Uh, I did that because I was really focused on the way that that action made Aaron feel. It made him feel unworthy. And that's something that I can relate to. I didn't write about that in the earlier scenes in the same way, but I wanted to share it in that way. Uh, we can do so many different things with the stories that we write and we can write endless possibilities. So when I say that, I, I, I'm gonna actually get us now into doing some writing. So here we are. Uh, first, I wanna say that you don't have to share what you're writing. I want everybody to do the writing, but if this feels very personal to you, I want you to just let it be personal and keep it to yourself. But if you wanna share it, so long as your class is sharing, that's something that you can do. Uh, we're gonna start now with a first exercise and that first exercise is starting with what happened. And as I said earlier, a difficult scene could be anything. You could write about something that was very difficult to you uh, that you're still dealing with, like the, the death of a grandparent. Or you could write about something as simple as losing a soccer game. It doesn't matter. It's what you want to write. In this exercise, I want you to take two minutes and think about uh, and write a few sentences about what happened, just a scene from your life. Just write it out. It doesn't have to be the best writing of all time. Just tell us what happened. So take two minutes right now and do that. Okay, you've taken two minutes, good. Uh, it might be that in your class, you'll share some of those, it might not. But in the second exercise, I'm gonna have you do something a little bit different. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to close your eyes. I want you to remember 
I want you to remember what are some of the feelings you remember having? Where did you feel those in your body? You might remember in some of the scenes, uh, some things about uh, Carson and the Porcupine of Truth uh, and where he was feeling the panic in his body. He felt him like a train was, sh uh, like a train was shaking uh, a station and making it feel like a body earthquake. Where do you feel the feelings in your body that you felt that day? I want you to take a few minutes and write those down. Okay, you did that? Good. Finally, here's a third exercise. Again, I want you to close your eyes. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to remember the setting of where you were when this thing happened. I want you to write down a list of the things, the nouns uh, that you remember in the scene. Uh, think of in, in, my, in the Porcupine of Truth, uh, the die. Um, think of in the, the bridge scene, his mother in skinny jeans. Uh, in the Porcupine of Truth, his father in Bermuda shorts. Um, in my, my own real story, you might remember there was a playpen. What were the things that you remember being around? Um, and I just want you to write down a list of the things you remember. And uh, you might as a group want to share some of those and you might not. Take a couple minutes. Okay, you got that done? Good. Finally, what I want you to do, and this is a homework assignment, uh, and if you want it, uh, what I want you to do now is I want you to write the whole scene. I want you to write about what happened, what you felt, where you felt it, and how the setting played into your memory. What sorts of things were part of the scene that can hold some of the feeling of the scene? Really, this homework assignment is writing this, the first story that I wrote. It is writing all of the things that were in the scene, what happened, uh, and how it felt. Um, and that's what we need to do. Even if we want to write fiction and we want to use some of our lives, we first need to write what really happened. And so that's the scene that I wrote, by the way, is not published anywhere. It's just something I wrote one day. So that's a homework assignment that you can choose. Uh, to do if you want to as a class. Anyhow, uh, I hope that this gave you a few things to think about. Uh, I hope that this was good for your LDEA. Uh, and I wish that we could do this in person. I really do. Okay, so there we are. Thank you so much. I'm Bill Konigsberg, and happy writing. <laughs>